Welcome to the Alumni Festival. I'm Dr. Jessica Gardner, the University Librarian, and we're here to talk about science archives. We're going to delve inside the minds of three of the world's greatest ever scientists. The session was prompted by the acquisition this year of the Stephen Hawking Archive, with thanks to the Hawking family and also to the UK government. I'm absolutely thrilled to say that the Hawking Archive now sits alongside the papers of Sir Isaac Newton, Charles Darwin, and the myriad other science papers that make up the University Library's collections. It's one of the most important science archives in the world and has that trinity, Newton, Darwin and Hawking at its very heart. I'm delighted to say that I'm joined today to discuss the scientific archive of these three leading figures by Dr. Katrina Dean, the Keeper of Archives and Modern Manuscripts at the University of Cambridge. Katrina is an external member of the Science Museum Group Collections and Research Committee and she's also the co-editor of William Henry Fox Talbot, Beyond Photography, in 2013. And she also edited the Journal of Archives and Manuscripts between 2017 and 2018. Also with me is Professor Jim Secord. From 1992 to 2020, Jim lectured at the Department of History and Philosophy of Science here at Cambridge, particularly in relation to issues of science, empire and communication. Jim is also the director of the outstanding research project that is the Darwin Correspondence Project based at the University Library of Cambridge and he's currently a bifellow of Christ College. Also with us is Dr Sarah Dry. Um, Sarah completed her PhD in Cambridge as a Gates Scholar and she's the author of many books and, and a well-known communicator of science. Her most recent book is Waters of the World, the story of the scientists who unraveled the mysteries of our seas, glaciers and atmospheres and made the planet whole. That was in 2019. Sarah has also written on Isaac Newton's manuscripts, Epidemics and the Global Health Policy, and about Victorian fishermen and risk. Sarah is currently working on a book about the history of systems thinking, focusing on the emergence of the study of climate as an interdisciplinary science in the 1960s and 1970s, with a special focus on paleoclimatology. From 2016 to 2021, Sarah was trustee of the Science Museum Group, and she's currently a trustee of the Oxford Trust. Now, this evening's format is simple, and I hope we're really going to enjoy ourselves. I'm going to ask the panellists to say a few words in a moment about what science archives mean to them, and then we'll move into a discussion between ourselves as a panellist. We will then move into a stage of having questions from all of you around the world, um, and we're really looking to hear, interested in looking forward to hearing your comments. If you've got any questions or comments, don't feel you need to wait until we've finished our panel discussion. If you just put them in the chat um, through the technology that you're using, we'll put them straight to the panel at the end. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. So let's make a start. Um, I am going to ask um, in chronological order, uh, starting with Sarah and then Jim and then Katrina. I'm going to ask each of you just to reflect for a couple of minutes, just to open us up in conversation um, on what scientific archives mean to you, Sarah. Oh, thanks so much. It's great to be here and with you all, if, if still virtually. Um, I think when I was thinking about this question, the image that came to mind is one of dark matter. And I, I thought I would, uh, you know, offer a, a kind of analogy with, with the concept of dark matter and say that we can think of archives as the kind of dark matter of historical material in the sense that it represents the lion's share of what happened, but it remains, you know, largely unseen. Um, and I think when we think about um, history of science in particular, there's this tendency to focus on moments of discovery that seem to punctuate history and often are used, um, particularly by scientists, as a way to represent uh, themselves to themselves, as it were. But the archives, if we think of those, those moments to switch metaphors for a minute, um, as kind of boulders in the stream of time, then I think we can think of the archives as the water that flows around it. Um, so we see pro in the archives, we see science as a process and not a product. Um, and in that sense, science is continually unfolding, changing, evolving. And I think um, that's always an important lesson to keep in mind, especially now when science is so contested and the meaning of truth and fact is so um, much a matter of public dispute Spending time in the archives reminds us that science is fundamentally an, an act of ongoing questioning. And so by, by um, you know, by exploring archives, we can remind ourselves of this and, and hopefully um, share that knowledge with the wider audience as well. 
Thank you so much, Sarah. I think that idea of archives as dark matter is going to stay with me for the rest of my working life, uh, in, in diving into <laughs> the archives uh, as we do. Uh, Jim. Well, when I thought about this question, I remembered something that really struck me when I was first in Cambridge doing research in, in the archives of Adam Sedgwick, the geologist. And it was Sir Peter Medawar, the biologist, the great biologist of the 1960s, who said that the scientific paper is a lie. And in many ways, that leads to precisely the same conclusion that I think that Sarah was just pointing to, that what happens is that what may be told in a scientific paper is truth, but if you really want to understand the process of science, you need to get behind it. And archives are really the way to do that. And there's a whole array of different aspects to that. Part of it is, of course, the collaborative nature of science, which often doesn't come out in papers, even when they're authored by many people. Um, and it's certainly when we do think about discovery, we tend to think of these heroic individuals. Archives, the archives of Hawking and Darwin and all the other figures, Newton, it really, behind them is this incredible array of other people that it, the archive connects you into. But for me, the thing I think, there are two other aspects that are really important. One is that the way in which archives ask, allow us to ask new questions all the time. Right now, for example, the Cambridge archives are being used very widely, and the scientific archives in particular, to answer questions about decolonization and questions about the involvement of the university in slavery. And we, we, without the archives, those kind of questions couldn't really be asked at all. And I think it's really fantastic that we can get at that. And then there's the other thing for me, which it really comes down to, and that's the very personal aspect of archives. There is this kind of immediacy and direct connection. When I first looked at the papers of the geologist Adam Sedgwick, you felt a bit like you were rummaging in his attic or his rooms at Trinity just after he had passed. And it was really amazing to see the organization of the archive was the same. At that point, I'm afraid a lot of the archival conservation was actually rather similar to the way it had been left when he was um, still alive. It was an extraordinary way of appreciating uh, just the personality and the person, the people that are behind science. And I think archives really do that for me. And they, in fact, they still do, even after I've seen literally hundreds of thousands of pieces of paper in the archive. Yeah, let's not pretend that it isn't thrilling to open that box and to find something that you haven't seen before will be, or be reconnected with a, a letter where, which brings so much meaning. It, you know, it really, it, it brings those lives um, into real focus and into our times. Katrina. So an anecdote that has really um, stuck with me is one from the astronomer Royal Martian Rees in his appreciation of Stephen Hawking, which is on the university's website. And um, Lord Rees describes how uh, he used to work in the same building as Professor Hawking and sometimes would, you know, push him through in his wheelchair. This is sort of the mid 70s. And um, Professor Hawking would go into his office and he, uh, he would fetch him a book on quantum theory, which wasn't something that Hawking had really looked into much previously. And then Martin sort of saw him sitting there for hours bent over, you know, he needed help to, pen to turn the page. And he really wondered, what was going through his mind and um, were his powers failing? Um, and it was about a year after that, tells Martin, that, he, that Hawking made one of his most important discoveries. Uh, and I think he's referring to Hawking radiation. And the point of that for me really is that you can't observe a scientist's thinking. You, you can't see what they're thinking and you don't know what's happening in their head. And all we have really are what some sociologists of science call the inscriptions. So these are the recorded statements, the um, written documents, the data, the images that are produced with the tools that scientists use, whether that be pen and paper, computers or machines, um, when they're you know, going about their business and doing the work that they do. So archives are really the red thread that help us to see how ideas are transferred, how data is recorded, and how knowledge circulates. Um, archives are sort of a subset of these inscriptions, and they're really important because they're often quite close, both in place and time, to the action when it occurred, and they're often part of the action themselves. So the creation of these archives is often part of the action. But they also travel a really long way. Um, and they can do so quite quickly, even in the past. And I'm just thinking um, of an example of, of Darwin sending his observations for Val, from Valparaiso to Cambridge, them being read out at a meeting of the Cambridge Philosophical Society, published in the journal. Darwin has time to write another letter to his sister complaining that this has happened, all before he even gets back from his Beagle voyage.
<laughs> it all happens a lot faster now, doesn't it? So um, thank you so much, Sarah, Jim and Katrina. I think we're going to pull on one of those threads uh, that Katrina has introduced for us now and just take a little look into um, each of those archives, Newton, Darwin and Hawking, and, and how they worked in different periods. And, and what I'd really like from each of you, if I can, is to draw out a little bit of the kind of um, the physicality of what we're talking about here, because I think um, it, 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 that is, is so much part of the vivid uh, way in which they can convey something of the life and something of the scientific life. Um, so I wonder if I could, um, um, again, let's come to Sarah first, um, tell us a little bit about how the papers that you've encountered have been written, what's in them and how they were organised. Um, we want to try and get through everyone, so I'm going to force you to sort of be a little bit, little bit succinct, but give us a flavour of what's excited you. Well, I think the thing to note about uh, the Newton papers, first off, is just their sheer profusion. It's a remarkable amount of material that Newton, who lived to be 84, wrote and kept over the length of his lifetime. It spans, you know, seven decades of a, of a life spent in close scholarship. So Newton was a man who lived with, with pen and ink um, as more comfortably than he lived with, with certainly people. And, and um, he saved almost, well, he saved a tremendous amount of what he wrote, 10 million words survive. Um, and what's fascinating about this is that the, the material is left in, in a great disarray actually on his death, um, not well organized, certainly not in ways that others could easily parse. And that lack of order has stymied scholars for nearly the past 300 years. We might only now be getting to grips with it. One thing to note is that, you know, there are, there are small notebooks, there are very large notebooks, um, there are bits of paper folded into various folios. He liked to take a sort of, you know, normal, um, what we would think of as kind of a normal A4 and fold it in half and then half again and um, create a little mini folio that he would stack. Um, he also returned to things frequently, so we can see him reusing paper. Partly, I think this was uh, to do with the nature of his thinking. He, he never left things, things were never finished, but it, it also reflects something of the value of, of paper as a commodity, as a resource at the time. One of the notebooks in the Cambridge Library is called the Waste Notebook, and this was a large, um, a large notebook that his stepfather had used and, and Newton had taken over for his own purposes and used it throughout his life. Um, and one of my favorite um, bits of the archive actually is a recipe that Newton wrote for the ink that he made. Um, he made his own ink uh, in addition to creating his own folios and recorded this recipe which involved uh, stewing the, the galls of oak, the dark um, knotty outgrowth of, of oak trees with uh, various additions including copper and beer and letting it stew and, and proudly wrote um, at the end of this recipe with this ink new made, I wrote this. So we can see here Newton really as a man of, 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 of pen and ink, as I, as I said. Um, so I think the sheer, the sheer disorder, the scale of the material, the, the, the importance of paper. And again, and, and then one last thing to say is that Newton is using paper in a way that, um, that's quite novel and innovative as a, as a tool for doing his research. In his early notebooks, which which are kept again, which 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 the library amazingly has, they record him uh, writing down a paper research program in in the the Trinity College notebook, as it's known. And this is a program that he sets out for himself, sort of extraordinarily um, diverging from the set curriculum. And it's an experimental program, and part of that means experiment, um, as we would think of it, with instruments. But it's also experiment in the sense of experimental thinking, and for that manuscript and writing is a key tool for him. So those are just some some of the ama many extraordinary aspects of Newton's archive. Uh, that's absolutely absolutely wonderful, Sarah. I mean, this, this is really the research data of its time, isn't it? You know, today, yeah. these digital bytes, then it was these, this, you know, uh, gall ink on paper, these inscriptions, uh, as, as Katrina says. What does that bring to mind for you for Darwin? 
Well, I mean, Darwin's archive in some ways is, has similarities in the sense that it is a very much a paper-based archive, and it is extraordinarily rich in terms of the range of materials it has. The, it ranges from material that were, was compiled when he was a child up until the final moments of his death and uh, the letters that go after that, family letters and so forth. So it, it's just an extraordinary picture of an individual's life, leaving aside the fact that Darwin's a great scientist. So it's really fascinating to be able to trace all of that. But the way I like to think about Darwin's archive also is that it's not just one archive, it's actually the archive of something close to 2,000 other people. <laughs> because of course Darwin kept, particularly after he became famous, his, his children encouraged him to keep all the letters that came in. So there are something like um, 9,000 letters in the university library here and about 15,000 letters altogether. And there are 2,000 different correspondents. And many of those people we would know absolutely nothing about if we didn't have the Darwin Archive. So being director of the Darwin Correspondence Project, of course, one of the attractions is working on Darwin. But for me, to be honest, really, I wouldn't have got involved at all in the project if it had just been about Darwin. And one of the best things that ever happened was the National Science Foundation said that they would help to fund the Darwin project if it did the correspondence both from Darwin but also to Darwin. And that for me is what makes it because it shows just completely how an archive can illustrate the way that science is a dialogue between different people but also just the fascinating individual stories of the people that are told there uh, in, in those letters. In, uh, from all over the world, everything from um, uh, chiefs in um, Africa to um, people who are writing from a Jewish synagogue in, the, in the Eastern Europe to farmers and physicians in the United States, all these different people coming in together. And you learn their stories as well. And I think that's, for me, the great thing about the Darwin Archive. Um, Jim, we're going to talk about collaboration a little bit uh, in a moment and kind of pick up a few bits there. Um, I'm just going to use Chair's privileges at the minute because there, there is just such extraordinary material in, in each of the archives uh, here that are represented in the library. Um, and I wish I could show you, um, everyone who's with us this evening, you know, one of the objects that always makes people smile in the Darwin Archive, and that is um, uh, they, these are um, drafts uh, of the origin of species which have been thrown away, we believe, by Darwin effectively and rescued from his waste paper basket by his kids, and on the back of which they've got these, these drawings haven't they of, of, of you know soldiers riding carrots and aubergines uh, and the darwin wars i mean the vegetable wars i mean it's just <laughs> the, the, it, it, it's those kind of little human insights that come out to you uh, and give such extraordinary joy and and also i think speak uh, as we may go on to talk uh, later in the session about how this material can talk to every different age group and that that is that is i think is really wonderful thing is learning as well as research objects hawking of course is the most um, recent acquisition we've got and, and katrina and i have been extraordinarily privileged to be kind of getting to know that in, in its first few weeks and months at Cambridge. Can you give us a flavour of what's there, Katrina? Okay. So writing is also central to the Hawking archive, but in a completely different way. So in 1963, Hawking was diagnosed with a motor neurone disease, which meant that um, sort of by the mid 70s, early 70s, he really couldn't handwrite anymore. Um, and so that, that's had a big impact on what's in the archive. And it may, means that he's had to work a lot uh, through amanuenses, so through people writing on his behalf and through human computer interaction. And in a way, Hawking's case kind of proves the rule a little bit because we often think about, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of handwritten as the original material that comes from the scientist with the idea, making the discovery, and then um, the sort of duplicated and replicated material is the stuff that circulates out in public and, uh, you know, becomes, becomes uh, knowledge and is, is popularised. But actually, in, in this case, it, it's a little bit different. And as we know from looking back in, in time as well, um, lots of scientists have worked, you know, through other people. So we've just recently purchased in the university library this uh, notebook of no Newton's bedfellow, um, or his, his room, roommate, basically, um, John Wickens. And it's, it's got some of Newton's sermons and letters in it. So, you know, that, that's happened in the past too, but I guess in, in Hawking's case, he really didn't have any choice at a certain point about how to go about that working. And I guess the other thing I should drop in is that Obviously, in theoretical physics, even in the 1970, even in the 1970s, handwriting was the tool of choice because you know, uh, doing formula, doing diagrams, all of that, 
so it, it, it was critical, um, really. So the archive, um, you know, it contains uh, lots of his drafts and lectures and all of that kind of stuff you would normally expect. There's correspondence, especially from the 1970s and 80s. Um, there's a lot of uh, material to do with his popular books, um, the scripts of the performances that he gave, his media work, videos of that. Um, lots of his honours and awards all around, you know, as he, as he had a growing reputation. So it, it's quite a diverse archive. But um, I think in terms of organisation, it suffers a little bit from this, I guess, worry about what is, what is an archive properly constituted by, what is proper for an archive? Is it only the original handwritten material? Or is it the stuff that is circulating? Is it the fan mail? And all of that kind of thing. And I think for us, the challenge as curators will be to sort of creatively work with that material in a way that makes it both accessible for researchers, but also has integrity around the way that Hawking and his establishment worked, and the way that other people, including other researchers, but also members of the public interacted with that establishment. Thank you. Uh, um, and it's great to mention the, the most recent Newton acquisition uh, by the University Library, uh, because, you know, what that also speaks to is that we are still collecting and we're still building on these extraordinary materials. And, you know, as well as, as you can hear uh, from Sarah speaking and, and Jim and, and Katrina, um, you know, there are still things to be found and new ways to look at them. Uh, and, and, you know, that is that is incredibly stimulating. Um, if I can just pick up on that question of collaboration, because I think this is really interesting. As Jim says, we often think of, 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 of these three scientists and, and of the great scientists as being you know, these great individual figures, uh, somehow kind of lonely and, 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 and unique in the world. But um, that was not true, um, at least in terms of, of, of two of the, uh, the figures that we're talking about. Newton has his own story, and we'll come to that. So why don't we leave Newton and, uh, to the last, in this, uh, rather than chronologically. And perhaps I can start with, with Jim, because uh, Darwin was an astonishing collaborator wasn't he? Mm. And, and I wonder if you can give us a sense of, um, of that process and how it's reflected in the archives. Well, I think there's a variety of ways it is. I mean, one thing to realise, of course, is that unlike much scientific work, Darwin did tend to write his papers by himself. So they're single authored papers. But behind that is a kind of, well, you called an establishment for Hawking. I think there is a sort of establishment behind him. It starts off with his family in the later part of his life, the part that the Darwin correspondence is looking at now. He had as an assistant, Francis Darwin, who did publish with him and worked very closely with him. And it, following the way in which Francis and Charles worked together as father and son, I think is really a fascinating story. So there's that aspect of collaboration. But then it, of course, builds out into a whole array of other collaborations. When Darwin was on the Beagle Voyage, as is clear from the letters that are in the university library, the, the other members of the ship were all kind of corralled in and brought in to, um, to help Darwin with his various researches. And when he got back, he was really good at um, incorporating people into his researchers that might never, in fact, disagreed with him about evolution and thought that it was quite a destructive idea, but he got them to send him specimens and help him out and so forth. And so we really see this in an absolutely fascinating way, I think, in the, in the Darwin correspondence, but also I think, if another way Darwin collaborates is by reading. Um, he annotates books and it has a, we have a wonderful part of the Darwin archive is the Darwin Library, which is annotated and very well, you know, you can really trace things through all these different paths. So, so I think that it, it really places Darwin as someone who's very much in that world. Um, in fact, I think one piece of advice I'd give is if you really want to understand how to win friends and influence people and get them to do things for you, just go on the Darwin Correspondence website. I'm making a plug now. Um, and you'll see the techniques Darwin uses to draw people in and to get them to join in in his projects and get excited about it. I, I mean, there was a real sense in that archive of the, of the, of the science as a social enterprise, isn't it? Which, which is a construct we think of as kind of a modern way of doing science, but it's absolutely evident there in the Darwin papers. Uh, and Jim, just before I move on to Katrina, um, you mentioned uh, the voyages and the books. Um, I'm right, aren't I, that, 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 that many of the books we have in the university library were actually on the voyages with him. So yeah. that, it's a just a lovely bit of the story. Yeah, one of the things, my favourite aspects of the Beagle Voyage is that Darwin actually slept in a library when he was there because the books were actually kept 
in a room that the captain had with the, where they used to eat, and then the books were all around the, the sides. And so I, I like this idea of Darwin being so involved with books that he slept with them there. Um, and a lot of those same volumes are actually in the, the library now with the, you know, and you can trace again the way that Darwin used them. So I'm sorry, I can't resist that because as chief librarian, that is my dream, is actually going to sleep in the library. And in fact, my husband is often trying to make me come home, but uh, I love being in the library with the books. Katrina, Hawking as a, a, and his collaborations, do you see that through the papers? You've given us a taste of it. And we... I think I've already indicated, haven't I, that, uh, you know, Hawking was collaborating even when he was working by himself uh, for, for much, of, much of the time. So, um, you know, first his family, but also then he had assistants who were working with him, students and others. Um, so, so that's definitely, you know, a part of the story. And another part of the story is collaborating with other scientists, so other theoretical physicists working in cosmology. So, for example, his uh, fellow PhD student, uh, George Ellis, who um, he wrote the uh, geometrical structure of space-time, I think, with... If I'm not quite sure if I got the title of that book right, but they worked on a book together that was published in 1973, published by CUP, and there's some good letters in the archive from Ellis writing to Hawking saying, well, how are we going to collaborate on this? Because I'm in Texas and you're in, you know, Cambridge, and you might be focusing on this thing and, and I'm doing that thing. And it's it actually, they, they're talking about how they're going to collaborate. You see it in different ways as well. So, you know, just um, a bit later, so sort of in the late 70s and early 1980s, Jim Hartle seemed to come and visit Hawking quite a lot came, came to Cambridge and they worked on the no boundary um, hypothesis together or the no boundary idea together and you can sort of see how those visits and those interactions are so important to what they're doing and of course Hawking himself traveled very widely Thank you so much. Now, I've left Newton to the last, Sarah, because he was a different kind of figure, wasn't he? Can you give us, can you give us any, I mean, it, so was Newton collaborative in how he, he researched? Let me give you an open question. Let's see what you come, come back with. I think the word collaborative isn't the first that comes to mind when we think about Newton, honestly. Um, but he certainly was communicative. And, you know, the idea of Newton as a solitary genius is, is certain, is, um, you know, it's a long-standing one, and it's one that uh, had already been established during his life. And like any cliche, it has elements of truth to it. Um, and we see, I suppose, the way to complicate that notion with the archive is to say that Newton was always in collaboration with himself, with his previous thinking. And we can see that very clearly in the way that he revisits ideas and indeed his early research program that I that I mentioned that he set out in this undergraduate notebook. He can he he revisits that, you know, throughout for, for 20 years. Um, so I don't think that we can look back retrospectively and see in Newton the kind of collaboration that Katrina is mentioning that that was more common um, for, you know, 20th century physicists. But certainly what we see in the archive is Newton in correspondence with his contemporaries, with fellow mathematicians, with the Secretary of the Royal Society. He's very eager to establish priority. He wants to bounce ideas off of people and learn from them. Uh, so I don't know if that's, um, if we want to still call that collaboration. Um, one thing I really should have mentioned earlier when talking about the archive is that um, if we think of the archive as a kind of imaginary whole that isn't just bounded by what's we're lucky enough to have in the Cambridge University Library, but encompasses the, the, you know, all surviving manuscripts, then we see an extraordinary Newton. Uh, again, the image of dark matter comes to mind because most of what Newton is doing in his life and what survives is, is non-scientific. Um, and a lot of what he spent his time on was, was church history, uh, chronology. He was fascinated with the idea that the true Christian religion had been corrupted. Now, why do I mention this in terms of collaboration? Well, in, in those researches, he engaged very closely with, um, as I said, early church history. And I don't think it's too far to say that he, he interacts with these historical figures from the, from the fourth century in a way as if they were contemporaries, um, prosecuting them in a sense to see whether their version of church history holds up or, and indeed could be resuscitated as the original uncorrupted one. So I think if we stretch the metaphor a bit, it's actually very useful uh, for guiding us in how we interrogate um, the archive because, because I think Newton who 
you know, he was a very public man, certainly later in life when he when he takes up his position at Master of the Mint in London. I mean, it's it's not right at all to see him as a as a cloistered don, but he was always a bit awkward with his fellow um, humans in person. But that didn't mean he didn't engage with them uh, to, you know, to to serve his own purposes, as it were. And he did have friends, to be fair. <laughs> uh, I'm loving that, Sarah. A bit awkward might be one of those understatements, but thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I'm going to see if I can just kind of uh, ask you to, uh, to give um, a, a shortish answer, and then we're going to move into... Um, Move into questions from from the community who are with us, uh, and it's you know really disappointing as well for me to encourage you to um, uh, from our audience members to put any questions you might have uh, through the, the technology in the chat because um, we'd love to come to your questions. I've got a couple queued up, but if, before I come to that, perhaps can I just ask um, each of you um, how did these scientists use their own archive if they did in their own work? Um, and I wonder if I could come to Katrina first on that. Okay, so um, there's an amount of uh, administrative, just regular administrative use of the archive. So, you know, keeping references on colleagues and, you know, managing uh, engagements and all of that. Um, and there's a lot around, uh, you know, as Hawking's fame grew, managing his, uh, all of his events and awards and honours and, uh, you know, media appearances and contracts and all of that. So obviously all of that had a function and a purpose in, in his office to kind of maintain and keep on top of all of that. I guess um, there are also some other questions which I think we need to probably explore a bit more with the archive, which are more to do with um, how much his, he used his archive to communicate effectively. So for example, a lot of his, uh, especially later on, a lot of his uh, talks, you know, he would recycle text from his computer archive and things like that. Um, and also you, you get a little glimpse in the archive as well where um, sort of some of his assistants are working with him and they're writing down statements that he is saying and they're sort of checked and revised. So there's a sense that maybe the archive was also used a little bit as a communication tool. Thank you. That's really fascinating. And uh, we should say that we were absolutely delighted that the acquisition of the Stephen Hawking archive uh, with the support of the family um, uh, went hand in hand with an acquisition of the uh, office and the physical objects from Stephen Hawking's uh, working life with the Science Museum. And that combination, I think, is really going to be interesting as we, as we delve into, into both of those and bring them together to tell the story of the life. Sarah, in terms of, of Newton, is there any way in which we can see how he, he used his own archive in his work? Well, I think I've mentioned already the way in which he's constantly returning to material, both, I mean, I said it a little bit tongue in cheek, it is true that he reuses paper just as a matter of practicality, but more substantively, he really does, um, he uses the, he uses his notes uh, as, and his organization of his research as a tool to, to structure that work over his life. Um, more specifically, um, he, tries to use some of the early mathematical work to establish priority in the dispute over calculus with Leibniz. Um, one thing to say about Newton is that he's intensely secretive about much of the material that's in this paper, in the, in the archives, and, and partly because a lot of that material related to um, heretical theological material, but I think also because uh, he, he was kind of like that. And he had cause to regret that later when he was trying to prove that he'd done work on the calculus before Leibniz. And at that point, he did go back and say, here, I have these, these documents from, from earlier. And so on some of them, it looks as if he's added in dates um, sort of after the fact, as it were. That's another thing about this archive is that it's maddening, maddeningly uh, un, undated much of the material, which has, um, you know, given generations of scholars um, a, a big headache. Uh, the, the other way that he used it that I can think of is in his alchemical work. A lot of, you know, we, we think about alchemy as being kind of a lab-based uh, practice, but actually there was, it was a, a lot to do with the circulation of secret manuscripts that were highly um, imagistic and symbolic. And he took extensive notes on these and created a, what he called a chemical index that was his attempt to kind of create, a, a, to systematize this um, mystical body of knowledge and apply something of the rigor to, to the study of, you know, the earth's vital uh, chemistry as he had done to, um, to, you know, the physics of motion and mathematics. So he, I think we can see Newton using his archive across a, a range of the very many aspects of his interests that are represented in it. 
Thank you. If we ever need reasons why archives matter, these are why they matter. <laughs> Darwin did delve into his own papers as well, didn't he? Yeah, Can you tell absolutely. us a bit about that? In fact, Katrina mentioned Hawking's office, and I think that um, Dar if you go to Down House today, you can still see Darwin's office pretty much home. Yeah, in his family house. Yes, that's right. And, and that was in the later part of his life. But really, you get a very good sense of somebody using paper for all sorts of different purposes. Um, he, by that point, he wasn't keeping notebooks so much. He had an experimental notebook. But basically, most of his um, material he kept on slips. And he would, um, if he found a letter that had something useful in it, he'd cut it apart and put the, that bit in the relevant file folder. So he was very instrumental about the way he used the paper that he had in terms of organizing different themes and different ideas. When he'd write a book, he'd actually mark it up depending on which bits were supposed to go into which chapter. Um, and then he, um, he that, that just grows as a body of material. And we have uh, an extraordinary range of that material going right back from the Beagle time when he was already keeping notebooks through the time he was living in London and then when he's at Down House. And I think also it's, it's interesting Darwin later on becomes, I think like Hawking, aware of the fact that he's famous. And so um, after The Origin of Species is published, his children encourage him to keep much more of his paper. Some of the things that he's kept aren't necessarily at that point useful specifically as for his research, but it's just because they might be of interest or use at some later point. And there's a very strong sense of history in the archive in that sense and family history. And in that sense, I think Darwin's practices relate not just to those of other scientists, but those of the social class, the genteel class to which he belonged. It's like a lot of the country house archives that you might find. And he's very much trying, he, it, it's that sort of world that he's part of, I think. I, I think you see that in each of these archives. Is that, is that there is a history making and a shaping that is going on through the, the conscious uh, saving of papers, um, even though uh, in each of these settings there's slightly different complexities to that, but there is a kind of a, a making of a life that is that is taking place through these. My experiments. favorite letters that way are the ones where it's uh, there's there's letters from his first um, well his first girlfriend basically Fanny Owen where um, on the back it says you know burn this and <laughs> of course that's always the kind of thing historians like to see. <laughs> and he doesn't well actually you've queued up because we've got a great question in from the audience which I'd, li I'd like to ask. Um, I know this is the kind of question that one's heart kind of uh, sort of uh, thinks what am I going to choose but the question I think is an absolute fair one. Uh, if I could come to, to Sarah then Jim then Katrina just to ask you what, what is the most exciting um, discovery or object that you found in the archives of Newton, Darwin and Hawking? <laughs> it can be for any reason, can't it? But and if oh, not, I'm God. going to agree. That's, well, I, you know what, I have to confess something here, which is actually a plug for the Cambridge Digital Library, um, which is that I didn't do research um, in the archives. My encounter with the with the archives has been mediated through through you know through the online um, medium. So I didn't. That's one of the I would say the few downsides of this incredible resource. So I will say that when I did, I did finally have a chance to come in and and see the archives after having studied them. And what struck me the most was the variety in their size. And to that end, I guess I'll say that for me the 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 document that has my heart, as it were, like emotionally, is is the the Trinity College notebook um, because it's so small. You know, it's it's the size of an iPhone, and you get the sense of and Newton in the in the front flyleaf of this notebook, he writes in very proud schoolboy script in 1661 when he's just arrived in Cambridge to to take up his studies. Um, Isaac Newton Trin call uh, Cantab, and and. So you, just, I, I felt a kind of, I mean, really unexpected closeness with, with Newton the man or the boy, on seeing this this piece, this object that he would have carried in his pocket. And in a way, that's a quite, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's it's a quite quotidian experience of the manuscript, right? I'm not responding so much to the content of it, but to its materiality. But I think. Um, I think it's important to recognize the emotional appeal of of these these what become almost relics and in that sense to to feel the young man starting off on his intellectual voyage in that way uh, was was um, 
you know, was surprisingly moving for me, having steeled myself not to treat these as, you know, relics of a saint. I found myself having a bit of a quiver. <laughs> well, I, I absolutely love that. Not, 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 not only for that sense of that frisson, which I, I felt hearing Sarah talk about that object, because I think we can all relate to that as much as you're, you know, drawing out the kind of intellectual meanings and, and make, remaking some meanings for the, for the historical purposes you were doing. You know, it is, it is hard to refuse the fact that there is a, a, a connection that one imagines, perceives, it is made, and, and, and that is okay, isn't it? I mean, that's part of what draws mm. us emotionally and intellectually to these pieces. So I, I think that's a wonderful answer. Um, Jim, you've got thousands to choose from. Where are you going to take us? <laughs> <laughs> well, I should say there's a lot of people who have made much bigger discoveries in the Darwin archive than I have. Uh, I got very interested in um, Darwin as a very young man when he was a student, and because it really struck me that um, if you're a student and you go, you know, first to Edinburgh, then to Cambridge, and it, your father is worried that you're going to become a wastrel or a mole catcher or whatever other things he says. Um, and then you get this opportunity to go on this voyage around the world. And I got really interested. What was the first thing that you would do when you got off the boat? Now, Darwin, unfortunately, wasn't able to land on Tenerife, where he was supposed to land. And he, he lands instead in the Cape Verde Islands. And I, to understand what he found out, I had to look at the um, big geology theoretical, um, well, they're, they're basically observational, but also mainly theoretical books that Darwin kept when he was on the voyage that recorded his thoughts about different subjects. And there was one on geology, so I looked at that. And it really was quite extraordinary. I mean, I have to say, I'm, I'm not a big fan of ideas of genius and all that, but Darwin really threw me because here you've got this young guy and immediately he goes there, he's engaging with Alexander von Humboldt and Leopold von Buch, two, two of the great continental geologists of the period. Um, and he's thinking about the relationship of what he's seeing to phenomena in the Mediterranean, the Temple of Serapis, as it was known near Naples. In other words, he's making global connections at the first place he's doing it. And he's not just doing it in a kind of speculative way, he's doing it in precisely the way that runs through all his later work, which is a combination of really detailed observation about particular beds of rock and shells and so forth, and these much larger kinds of conclusions. And I have to say, it really, it, it kind of blew me away, actually, really. Uh, Jim, um, just remind me, he, he, Don was what, 21, 22 when he went on the Beagle voyage? He was very yeah, it's something young, like wasn't that. he? So it's extraordinary yeah, to think of that. Um, yeah, that youth. He, he was born in 1809, yeah, and it's, it's 1831, 32 that he's there. Yeah, so, yeah, extraordinarily really young. Um, Jim, um, you're, you, you've given us a, girl, a glimpse of an early girlfriend. There is, there is one very famous um, uh, piece of writing in the archive which talks about um, Darwin's um, contemplation on marriage. Can you give us a little flavour of that? I know. It's, it's, <laughs> It's just fun, but it's, it's a wonderful thing to, to well, have there. Yeah, I kind of think this is when Darwin is acting as an accountant, because what he does is, is I'm, I'm sure many of you listening to this know about this document, but if you don't, do have a, have a look. Just type in Mary, not Mary, Darwin correspondence, and you'll see it. It isn't actually a letter, but it, what it does is on one side he says Mary, and on the other side he says not Mary. And on the Mary side, uh, well, the, the not Mary side, there are things like lots of time to do work, um, you know, able to go to Wales, could go up in a balloon. Um, and um, then in the, the, if he, he's worried about what happens if, he, if, he does, if he's all by himself, he says the disadvantages. And I mean, some of the, he says, you know, well, he says, um, you know, what does it really mean to be single? And, you know, a nice soft wife on a, a sofa, he says, better than a dog anyhow. <laughs> I think we'll leave that there, actually, but it is a fantastic document. So, uh, Katrina, I mean, it's, it's a slightly unfair question to you, I mean, because we, we, we were just making sense of this wonderful archive. So, discover your favourite object. You I can was keep going it to forward. say, you've put me at a bit of a disadvantage here, because I do not claim knowledge of every object in the archive. But one thing I found quite early on, when I was unpacking it uh, with my colleagues back in March, was a, a little decorative box, um, like you would keep a piece of jewellery, and I opened it up, and inside was a campaign for nuclear disarmament badge. And I thought, oh, what's this? Is this just something that's sort of just
just landed here because it was in the office and sort of swept up with a whole bunch of other things? Or does this have meaning and, and significance? And I did a bit of online searching and all of that. But actually, um, when I was sort of looking through, you know, parts of the archive, because I have to do particular things, you know, I'm looking for, you know, something in particular, you just see other documents. I saw this great open letter from Jane and Stephen Hawking in 1981. And it's to all their friends, East and West, for, um, and they're setting up the Newnham Against the Bomb local residents group, and they <laughs> encourage others to do the same. Mm -hmm. So I guess that was kind of one of those things. You, you, you know, archives are a bit like found objects. You just, you, you see things in there and you don't really know what they mean, but over time and, and with, you know, the, the good work that goes on both by archivists and researchers, you start to understand how it all fits together. I think that's a great answer, Katrina. And, and it, I mean, one of the things that's different from, to Hawking, to Newton, to Darwin, that with Hawking, of course, this was a life lived recently in Cambridge mm. uh, and hugely, uh, you know, a figure obviously known and, and, and celebrated uh, around the world but also of huge resonance in Cambridge itself so I think those local strands really matter don't they and, and we know that as we were beginning to process and take in that archive you know people begin to get in touch and say this is my story this is what my encounter was this was my memory uh, often of a wheelchair going very fast and knocking people off the pavements which I think was a, a, a kind of um, an experience with students uh, as we are at the alumni festival kind of mem you know held dear as something that had happened them in Cambridge with, with the great, uh, great Stephen Hawking. So um, th those kind of um, intimate kind of uh, local stories, I think, are really, really profound as well for us sitting here in, in Cambridge. Um, we are, the clock is ticking off on us, and I'm so sad about that. So we've kind of got, a, we've got another great question from the audience, um, uh, which I think is quite a good one to kind of come to a close on, actually. Um, so I'm going to ask for just a, just a, a, a minute or so from, from each of you. Um, and that really is looking ahead, because in a digital world, what does the future of science archives look like? Um, and Katrina, I know, uh, will end with because she is, uh, you know, a, 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 a both historian of science but also uh, a, a curator and a leading keeper of archives, and, and will have some views. But I'm wondering if Sarah, do you have reflections on that as a historian? I mean, what, what does the future look like? Well, actually, I think it's really good to think with the Newton Archive about this because, in one way. Um, digitization would have horrified Newton because the material that he left behind, uh, he had kept almost entirely secret during his life, except for his kind of tactical use of certain documents in ways that I've mentioned. Um, and yet he did leave the document. He ensured he kept it throughout his life. And while he, he didn't um, draw up a will on his death, which leaves us with questions, he the material was there and he had some hope that it would be looked after. Um, so, But he would have been horrified, I think, at that time to think that it would have been made public. And yet I think part of what he hoped for all of his researches, but especially the work on theology that he did, um, as I said, was, was that he would uncover original truths about the nature of Christianity that would one day be understood and accepted by the public. So I think Newton might say, well, perhaps that day when that day comes, uh, digitization will enable th that truth to be more widely spread. Um, less tongue in cheek, I think, what digitization allows us to do for someone like Newton and, and for many scientists is really um, put back together pieces which we're all too likely to want to separate. So the materials that are in the Cambridge University Library relating to Newton are, are those materials that were deemed scientific um, in the 1870s by, by men who were cataloging them and the so-called non-scientific papers went elsewhere and through qu various quirks of fate, uh, most of them ended up in libraries as well. Um, but what digitization allows us to do is bring that material back together again um, as it hasn't been uh, really since, since Newton's death and of course make it accessible for others. And it also just to end, it, it releases us from the need to attempt complete editions. Uh, I think, as I said, Newton was, um, you know, he was never at rest, he was never finished. And the digital medium allows us to um, represent that endless quality and the open quality of the archive as Newton used it, and certainly as it exists subsequently in response to our changing questions of it. So in that sense, I think it returns it to us in a, in a strangely more appropriate form. 
I, I, I think that's a lovely answer and in the interest of time because we, we, we're running down because we, we need a right. whole next session to, to, to explore this one. So uh, I'm sorry we just touched on that lightly, but I, I think that, you know, that's such a great answer and, and, and such an important mission for the University Library of Cambridge is to digitise the material as fully as possible. That's been behind the Diamond Correspondence Project. We'll, we'll work with, with stakeholders around the, the, uh, the Hawking Archive uh, as well. And of course, when we did um, digitise and make his... Uh, PhD thesis open access uh, about three years ago. Uh, so popular was that around the world, the million hits at once, particularly when Hawking put it on his Facebook page that it crashed the university servers. So it's a testament to why you know, these figures are such a popular imagination, so important, uh, and it's really intrinsic to the mission of us at Cambridge to record, to document, to archive these lives um, and these scientific works so that, that future scientists uh, can be inspired by them, whether they're, uh, whether they're five years old or, or 50. Uh, and, and all the work that can happen in between it, it, it is something we're passionate about and, and you can see we could talk a lot more this evening and I'm sorry I'm sorry to kind of cut us off uh, but I, it's my job to say thank you to everyone to our speakers to Katrina Dean to Jim Seacord and to Sarah Dry you, you've been absolutely wonderful and shared your knowledge both lightly and and, and, and with with great um, uh, great interest and enthusiasm so thank you so much um, and to say thank you to all of our alumni who are taking part tonight uh, we've loved being uh, having this conversation about the holy trinity of Newton Darwin and Hawking all under one roof now at the University Library, of which we are so proud. Thank you. <laughs>